there is a huge controversy amongst modern Muslims about the expansion of the Khilafah. And a lot of times what we have been taught or have heard people say is that these expansions were defensive in nature. That the Sharia does not allow an offensive war. This is the claim that is given. And this is a claim that is simply false and incorrect. The claim that there's no such thing as offensive jihad and that the Muslims of early Islam never engaged in conquests is a claim that is simply not backed up by any shred of evidence. In fact, the opposite is true. And that is an undeniable fact, which is why nobody pre-modernity ever said this. In the seerah of the Prophet we can say that very clearly most of the battles were necessary and were defensive to gain the rights of the Muslims back. However, it is also true to say that not all such battles can easily be put into this category. Some battles, especially some saraya, and remember saraya was the ex expeditions the Prophet did not participate in, he sent others out. Many of the saraya, especially in 9th and 10th is, uh, Islam, there was no dire need, there's no threat at all. Going to the fringes of Oman, for example, right? Going to the other side of Bahrain, for example, it's not as if there was an immediate threat in some of those saraya. And especially, we talked about the Battle of Tabuk. The Battle of Tabuk remains a big question mark amongst Sira specialists. Why? Why was one of the largest armies ever sent up north? For what? And in reality, it seems one of the strongest reasons is to show the powers up north that Muslims meant business and that they are going to attack, which is why Abu Bakr al-Siddiq took the initiative to attack. Followed the same route when he went to attack, when he went to attack Sham. Same route of Tabuk. And he went from Tabuk onwards. So the Prophet was basically setting the precedent for them. Now, whatever is the case about the time of the Prophet there is simply no denying that the Khulafa al-Rashidun and the Umayyads engaged in offensive conquests of other lands. The Sassanid Empire did not pose any immediate threat. They were not attacking the Muslims at all. When the Muslims attacked the Sassanid Empire, Rustum said, what are you guys doing here? Why are you attacking us? I mean, we're not bothering you. What are you doing over here? Remember that was the famous... And the Romans as well couldn't care less about the Arabs. Remember we said this from the very beginning. Both the Romans and the Persians, or I should say the uh, Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire, that's the more precise term, they were minding their own business fighting each other. There was still no immediate reason for them to invade. There's no threat at all. And yet Abu Bakr al-Siddiq sent armies of tens of thousands of people. And Umar al-Khattab followed suit. And the same goes uh, when Umar al-Khattab sent Amr ibn al-As into Egypt. Egypt was not sending any army into Arabia. And Amr ibn al-As with 4,000 people said, Give me 4,000 people, I will give you Alexandria, which was the capital of that region. I'll give you, I'll give you Alexandria. Why? What was Alexandria doing to the Muslims? Nothing. So the claim that oh, all of this is a defensive uh, battle, frankly, it, it, it's not proven by anything. And it's, it goes against common sense. Why would you send tens of thousands of people when there's no threat at all? And the fact of the matter, therefore, there is simply no denying this. And the same goes, by the way, even for our lands of, of, of India, of, of Sindh, uh, Makran. Why would the... Okay, it's true that a pirate... Uh, or a small mini lord basically irritated some of the Muslim, you know, uh, uh, traders. There's no doubt. But you don't send an army to attack because of a trade dispute. Think about it. You don't send an entire naval expedition to conquer land, which is what happened in Sindh. They conquered land. And they established 
the Umayyads established an extension of the Umayyad dynasty over there. And that was the beginning of uh, Multan. Multan was the earliest uh, uh, Islamic um, land. Uh, Makran and Multan, these areas were the earliest Islamic lands. From the time of the Sahaba, some of the Sahaba uh, were alive at this time when Multan was, was conquered. What, what for? You're going to establish a mini dynasty over there? For what? So clearly, uh, there's not just a defensive jihad going on here. There's no denying that the early Muslims wanted political conquest. Now, Again, maybe because of who I am, but I can't sugarcoat this. I have to be brutally honest with you because I want you to understand da'wah is not so simple. You go knocking on doors, you preach to them, give them a pamphlet, and then they're going to convert. We've done this, been there, done that. I did this when I was 17 years old in Houston, and now I'm in my fort. It doesn't work. And if anybody tells you otherwise, I'm sorry, but they're lying to you or they're mis mistaken or whatever. Da'wah, generally speaking, is a dry field. In my humble opinion, da'wah is not primarily done via the tongue, via intellectual arguments, via solid, logical, rational debate. It doesn't done that way. It's not done that way. So we need to overcome this issue of da'wah being an intellectual exercise, of da'wah being a rational argument of knowing how to respond to these debates. No, on the contrary, conversion to another faith is not usually an intellectual process. It is a psychological one. It is an emotional one. When you convert, it's not generally speaking because of a deep-seated philosophical debate that you had with somebody else. Not at all. Look around you. Who converts in our own community? The number one group of converts are those married to Muslims. That's the number one group. Always it was either the political dominion or their rulers. And essentially it's, that's another type of political dominion, right? And by the way, this is why I myself, I never sugarcoat the political expansion of Islam. It's ludicrous to do so. Listen to my seerah. Listen to my, when I talked about Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu and the wars of expansion. And I go into this detail. Was Islam expanded by the sword? And I'm very frank. This is not the time to go into there. But because of my experiences, I never sugarcoat. I never give you a, a, a romantic romanticized view and then the truth is other than that because it doesn't work that way we would not be here today as Muslims if Muhammad ibn Qasim and Amr ibn al-As didn't go and want to conquer Hind and Egypt for reasons that were no threat to Islam we thank Allah that ibn Qasim came to our lands I thank Allah that Islam came through political means and that's what we you know we have to be blunt about